Hello YouTube. Uh, today I'm going to uh, examine an interesting argument given by Harry Collins in his book uh, Changing Order. He's a sociologist of science uh, but there are many parts of his book that have uh, interesting implications for philosophy of science uh, and his uh, kind of big idea is, uh, is this thing called the experimenter's regress. Uh, so uh, we tend to assume that, uh, in principle at least, the relation between theory and experiment is fairly straightforward, right? Theories make predictions and we can perform experiments to test these predictions. If the experiment confirms the prediction, that's good for the theory. If it disconfirms it, that's bad for the theory. Um, now, of course, in practice, it may be difficult to perform an experiment, uh, but conceptually, at least, the, the relation is, is simple. Uh, well, the experimenter's regress raises some, some problems here. And basically, the argument goes as follows. For an experiment to serve as a test of a theory, we need to know that the experiment is constructed so that it will give us the correct result. But what is the correct result? Well, we can only know uh, what the correct result is by using a reliable detector and seeing what result we get. I mean, be before, we've, before we've checked, before we've used uh, a, a good detector, then obviously we, we don't know what the correct result is. You know, that's precisely why we're looking, right? But then what exactly is a reliable detector? Well, a reliable detector is just a detector that gives us the correct result. Um, you know, we're, we're reasoning in a circle here, right? In order to know that we're getting the correct result, we need to have a reliable detector. But we can only know that we have a reliable detector if we know that it's giving us the correct result. Uh, so this argument is, so far, it's kind of abstract. It might be a little bit unclear. Um, so let's look at a specific case. Uh, a lot of Collins's work as a sociologist of science has uh, focused on studies of gravitational waves. Um, you may have heard uh, just last year there was um, yeah, a bit of a hubbub among astronomers because uh, gravitational waves have been detected for the first time. Uh, they were detected at LIGO and um, they were produced by a pair of colliding black holes. Um, that was a pretty big story uh, early last year. Uh, so, you can sort of think of gravity waves as, as kind of ripples in space-time. If you have um, very large masses accelerating rapidly, they will create disruptions in space-time. They'll bend space-time, and uh, waves of this distortion will propagate outward at the speed of light. This was predicted by general relativity, um, but these ripples are incredibly difficult to detect. Uh, the first gravity wave that was detected at LIGO, um, it, the, the actual effect that it had was to change the length of a four kilometer arm by uh, one thousandth the width of a proton. So that's a pretty small change. It's uh, equivalent to the uh, changing the distance from the sun to the nearest star, which is about four light years away, uh, changing that distance by the width of a human hair. So these, these are extremely difficult uh, to, to detect. Uh, scientists have been trying to detect gravitational waves for about 50 years. Uh, and Collins has been involved in this community almost since the beginning. So he's published um, loads of papers and quite a few books on the search for uh, gravity waves. Uh, the first person to try to detect gravity waves was the physicist Joseph Weber. He developed an instrument known as a Weber bar, which was a two meter long uh, aluminium bar, and he was looking for changes in length. Now, obviously, there are all kinds of factors that can induce minuscule changes in length. Uh, if the temperature changes or an earthquake happens on the other side of the world, uh, you know, or whatever. So we need to remove these sources of noise. Uh, anyway, in the, in the late 60s, Weber published positive results. He thought he was detecting gravitational waves. Many scientists were immediately skeptical of Weber. Um, for one thing, because gravitational waves were known to be so difficult to detect, so obviously scientists questioned whether Weber's instrument was reliable. Uh, a second reason was that the detection rate claimed by Weber entailed a far higher flux of gravity waves than was permitted by the uh, contemporary physical theory. One critic worked out that if Weber's claims were correct, then given our knowledge of physics and so on, the universe should have burned itself out in about 50 million years. 
uh, all, all of its energy would have been converted into gravitational radiation if the uh, flux of gravitational radiation was as high as Weber claimed. Now, of course, this isn't a conclusive argument against Weber because maybe it's the case that there really is such a high flux of gravitational radiation and the problem is that there's a mistake in, in our current physics or in our general knowledge of the universe. Unexpected experimental results have often prompted important changes in scientific theories. So a debate arose uh, about whether Weber's detector was giving a correct result. And this involves us in the experimenter's regress. Here's how Collins put it, and I quote, what the correct outcome of Weber's experiment is depends on whether there are gravity waves hitting the Earth in detectable fluxes. To find this out, we must build a good gravity wave detector and have a look. But we won't know if we have built a good detector until we have tried it and obtained the correct outcome. But we won't know what the correct outcome is until, and so on ad, infin ad infinitum. So we have this circle of reasoning, um, you know, this, this kind of circle of dependence between what the correct results are and what a good detector is. And the question is how we break into that circle. This has uh, interesting implications for the replication of experiments. It's commonly thought that we can determine the legitimacy of an experiment by replicating it uh, and then perhaps varying certain factors. So we might build a gravity wave detector out of different materials or we might apply a different statistical analysis to the results to account for noise and so on. You know, we, we, we alter experiments so as to increase their sensitivity and make them more reliable. Uh, unsurprisingly, in response to Weber, other scientists tried building their own gravity wave detectors. Six other experiments were performed and they all failed. They all were unable to detect gravity waves. So that looks pretty bad for Weber. Six negative experiments, you know, that, that looks like it's going to refute his claims. But because of the experimenter's regress, things aren't so simple. These experiments only refute Weber if we assume that they use reliable detectors, whereas Weber did not. Unsurprisingly, Weber responded that their detectors, uh, or at least their methods of analysis, were inadequate. And this kind of response looks pretty reasonable. Uh, I mean, if we, think, if we think that there are high fluxes of gravity waves, for example, so we think that the correct result is the result that shows high fluxes of gravity waves, then of course there must be something wrong with these six experiments. Uh, and no number of experiments that have been poorly conducted could provide any convincing evidence. Um, so, so, so Collins challenges the importance of replication because we can always suppose that an attempted replication just hasn't been performed properly. Replication can only serve as a check on, on, a, on a previous experiment if we know that the, replication, the, that the replication of the experiment uses a reliable detector. But if we know what counts as a reliable detector, we'd already be able to evaluate the original experiment and the replication would be superfluous. So that's you know, kind of an interesting consequence. Now, an important point that Collins makes is that in many experiments, the regress doesn't arise. And this is because there's a universal consensus on what the correct result is. Today, in 2017, there's a universal consensus that if I point a telescope at Jupiter, I should see the disk of Jupiter with four moons next to it. Or actually, maybe I'll see fewer moons uh, if one of them is behind the planet or whatever. Um, but you know, you're going to see a, a, like a disk with some points of light around it. And if I don't see this, uh, it, it, all would agree that there must be something wrong with my telescope. We know in this case what the correct result is and we know what a reliable detector is. The question is how this kind of consensus is achieved in the first place, right? I mean, once you've got a consensus, that's, that's fine and the regress isn't a problem. But the question is how you get that consensus. Um, the experimenter's regress arises when scientists try to perform experiments on previously unexplored phenomena, such as uh, you know, gravity waves in, in, the, in the 1960s. Now, this uh, regress has provoked a lot of discussion because it seems to undermine the rationality of science. We usually think that the debate between different theories is decided by you know, the facts. Um, you, know, you have a theory, you check it against the facts, or at least you check it against experimental results. But because of the experimenter's regress, 
it's not clear which experimental results we should take seriously. Right, that's the challenge. Um, n you know, we, we think that n not all experiments are equal, as it were. And you know, the challenge is determining what counts as a, a good experiment, um, which experiments we should take seriously and we should use to test our theories against. Collins's own view is, is quite radical. Uh, he thinks that scientific discovery is m more a matter of, of kind of social negotiation between competing groups. It's, it's, not a, it's not about scientists responding to facts in an independent world. Scientific debates necessarily involve uh, irrational or non-rational, at least, social forces. So Collins is, is very much in, in a kind of social constructivist camp. Um, I think it, more precisely, Collins wants to argue that there really isn't any distinction between uh, kind of epistemological rules and non-rational social forces. So in the article, um, The Experimenter's Regress as Philosophical Sociology, Collins distinguishes four views. Um, so number one, disputes can be resolved by epistemological criteria alone. Number two, disputes are resolved by social forces alone. Three, disputes are resolved by a combination of epistemological criteria and social forces. And finally, there is no distinction between epistemological criteria and social forces. Uh, so it, 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 epist epistemological criteria uh, include, and I quote, theoretical argument, experimentation, and rational evaluation. So this is the stuff that, uh, you know, that, that, that we've sort of covered earlier in this series. This includes the, the kind of rational methods that have been proposed by some philosophers of science. Inductivism, the hypothetical deductive method, falsificationism, and so on. On the other hand, social forces include, I guess, just all of the other factors that might influence a person's belief. The style in which a paper is written, the reputations of the scientists involved, the background cultural attitudes and beliefs. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's really no end to what we might list here. I mean, there might be a scientist who's biased in favour of people with brown hair, so he'll be more inclined to accept an experimental result if the experimenter has brown hair. Um, so what's being asserted by this first position is that scientists can resolve disputes by just applying certain abstract rules. Now obviously certain social forces will need to be in play as background conditions. Scientists need funding, they need to get their work published, uh, they need to be free from certain forms of government interference and so on. But provided we have the right social context we should, in principle, be able to uh, resolve disputes by pl applying these epistemological criteria. Uh, we can apply these rules in a kind of algorithmic way, and that will that they will lead us to the answer. And that's a pretty yeah. You know, that's the sort of traditional view of of how scientific disputes are resolved. Collins argues in favour of this fourth position that actually it just doesn't make much sense to draw a distinction here. When we examine how scientists, <clears throat> when we examine how scientists actually uh, break the regress, the distinction doesn't make any sense, right? Giving a rational argument, say, is necessarily going to involve social forces that traditional philosophers would consider to be epistemologically irrelevant. Uh, Collins discusses a paper by a scientist that he calls Q. Um, so I, I should just say Collins was doing a bit of anthropology in in his uh, in his book and um, you know, it's just one of the methods that's involved in this is you keep everybody anonymous so he uh, means you know, he talks about Q and W and Z and so on uh, to maintain the, the anonymity of the scientists involved um, uh, anyway uh, Q and his colleagues published a, a, a paper in the early 70s that was highly critical of Weber and it was a very aggressive paper uh, this is because Q just thought the whole debate was ridiculous and he wanted to end it. He explicitly set out to write a paper that would just put an end to this to this nonsense about gravity waves. Um, now Q uh, did, performed an experiment but his own gravity wave detector was nothing special. It was actually uh, less sensitive than Weber's detector. Q uh, only bothered running an experiment because he felt that this uh, that he had to do an experiment in order to get his paper noticed, right? He had to kind of gain credibility for his paper. And part of that 
in science involves doing experiments. Um, I don't actually have the quote on me, I'm afraid, but, but Collins does explicitly quote Q saying this. So this isn't something that Collins has kind of assumed. Q explicitly says that he only performed the experiment uh, in order to kind of get credibility for his paper. Um, but actually, Q felt that the, uh, the kind of abstract argument was enough. Uh, so, uh, as I said, Q's paper was written in a very strident tone. Now, before Q, many criticisms of Weber had been raised, but they were all quite tentative, and many scientists were fairly open-minded. Q was assertive, and Collins says that this triggered uh, a transformation of scientific opinion. So, the, the negative results that were once merely suggestive criticisms um, they became seen as decisive refutations after Q. Right? After Q, after Q came along and was very assertive and aggressive, other scientists felt able, I guess, to act in the same sort of way, and so a consensus was formed that Weber was just wrong, and that uh, you know there were, and that the the other experiments uh, refuted Weber. Uh, so assuming that Collins's analysis of this case is correct, then the situation seems to be this. The scientific community was converted against Weber partially due to the aggressive tone of Q's paper. Traditionally, this is something that would be seen as simply uh, you know, rhetoric, right? It's, it's not actually important to the argument, the tone that you express yourself in. It's not something that has any epistemological relevance. And, and yet this was important uh, to converting the scientific community. On the other hand, uh, experimentation would normally be seen as having important epistemological force. But uh, Q's own experiment was explicitly conceived as being merely rhetorical. It was just something he had to do in order to get noticed. So in this kind of case, um, you know, the, the epistemological criteria and the social forces seem to be blurred. Now, just to relate this to some of the previous videos, I, I should note that this kind of view uh, does seem to lend support to Feyerabend's arguments against method. Um, you know, it, it looks like Collins is coming from a similar sort of place uh, as Feyerabend, right? He's going to be against the idea that, that science proceeds through the application of, uh, of kind of abstract universal methods. Um, so I think that, that Firebend would be would be pretty happy with this sort of argument. Okay, let's consider how we might respond to Collins. The, the main kind of response has been to try to develop epistemological criteria that are sufficient in themselves to break the regress. Uh, and I think that at this point, one one thing that's worth clarifying uh, about the structure of Collins's argument is, as far as I can tell, nothing of much importance actually follows from the experimenter's regress in itself. The question is how the regress is broken, right? Collins says that in order to break the regress, social forces will always be involved. Um, or at least, you know, when we look at how to break the regress, we can't really distinguish the epistemological criteria from the social forces. Um, now, I don't think anyone would deny that, that this regress exists, right? But what uh, more traditional philosophers will try to do is show that there are rational methods that can break it. Okay, let's look at some options. Um, one very important aspect of science is calibration. Uh, essentially, calibration involves testing an instrument using phenomena that are already well understood. So, uh, in this case, uh, we know beforehand what counts as a correct result. And if the instrument gives us the correct result for the well understood phenomenon, then uh, we have reason to trust the instrument when we use it to investigate previously unexplored phenomena. For example, let's say I have a thermometer made of mercury. Uh, mercury freezes at about minus 39 degrees centigrade, so it can't be used for lower temperatures. Alcohol has a much lower freezing point than mercury, so we might think, okay, let's build a thermometer out of alcohol. But then how do we know that alcohol is a, a you know, good measure of temperature? Well, we use the alcohol thermometer in the same range as the mercury thermometer, and we check whether it gives us reliable results. You know, we check how the al alcohol responds to temperature in the range that uh, that we use the mercury for the thermometer for, and uh, and then we can sort of uh, 
fix the, the alcohol thermometer that way. So then we can trust it when we use it at lower temperatures. We use the mercury thermometer to calibrate the alcohol thermometer. Now, you should already be able to see that things probably aren't quite as simple as I've suggested there because we're still relying on the assumption that alcohol behaves the same way at lower temperatures as it does at temperatures at which mercury is liquid. And that assumption could be false. Um, but still, uh, you know, I, th I think it's, you, you can sort of see how this, this kind of thing is, is supposed to work, uh, how calibration could, can give you at least uh, some reason to believe um, that your, your instrument is reliable. Calibration was used in the gravity wave debate. Some scientists tried to calibrate their uh, gravity wave detectors by applying uh, an electrostatic pulse to them. These pulses could cause the antenna to vibrate in such a way uh, that was well understood. And it was thought that gravity waves should have the same effect. So if the detector gives the right result for electromagnetic pulses, we can rely on it to give us the right result for gravity waves. So you can calibrate um, the gravity wave detector using the electrostatic pulses. Unfortunately, Collins argues that this doesn't break the regress. And this is because we can always ask whether the phenomenon that it is used to calibrate the instrument is an adequate surrogate for the phenomenon we're trying to detect. Are electrostatic pulses a good surrogate for gravity waves? Will they have the same effects on the instrument? Our answer to this question depends on our view of uh, what the properties of gravity waves are. Different views of gravity waves will lead to different views of what kinds of calibration should be used. So returning to the alcohol thermometer, the point is that we have a prior understanding of what temperature is and how to measure it. We have that with the mercury thermometer. So you know, what, what we want in the alcohol thermometer is just something that works the same way as the mercury thermometer, but that can go to lower temperatures. Now with gravity waves, uh, well, at least the, the kind of high fluxes of gravity waves that Weber claimed to detect, we didn't really have a, a prior understanding of them. We didn't have a, a prior reliable detector of them. Weber was exploring something completely new. So you know, the, the calibrations performed by Weber's critics, they tell us either that there is no high flux of gravity waves or that electrostatic pulses are not good surrogates for gravity waves. And you know, that, the claim that electrostatic pulses are an inadequate surrogate is, is pretty reasonable because we, we didn't understand what the properties of gravity waves were. So you know, that why shouldn't we question that assumption? All right, so maybe calibration doesn't work. Uh, maybe though there are other criteria that could break the regress. Here's another idea suggested by uh, Ian Hacking um, in a somewhat different context. Uh, Hacking has an argument that the uh, reason why scientists are so confident that microscopes give an accurate picture of the world is that different microscopes built according to different physical principles will display the same objects. For example, if you uh, observe red blood cells through an electron microscope, you'll see uh, little black spots on them called dense bodies. Now, you could ask whether these dense bodies are real or if they're just an artifact of the microscope. Well, we think they're real because the same thing can be seen when blood samples are viewed through a, through a fluorescence microscope. Electron microscopes and fluorescence microscopes are very different systems, um, but they, they give us the same picture. They both show these dense bodies. And this is something uh, that we call robustness. Uh, evidence is said to be robust when the same uh, evidence is acquired through different processes. Now, can we use robustness to break the regress? Well, again, uh, this seems to run into some problems. It seems that the regress simply arises again in making judgments of robustness. So, so to thinking about the Weber case, Suppose some other detector operating on different physical principles also gave positive results seemingly similar to Weber's results. Well, if prior to this experiment we're skeptical that Weber's experiment was constructed correctly, then it's not clear how this next experiment could give us robust evidence. If we think that Weber's experiment was just wrong and its results should be explained away, then we don't have two experiments pointing to the same result, right? I mean, 
Weber doesn't even have a result that's worth considering. In order for evidence to be robust, we need to judge that both Weber's experiment and the subsequent experiment were constructed correctly. So there's the regress. Um, I mean, with, with respect to Hacking's example of the dense bodies on blood cells, uh, in this case, again, there's kind of a wide consensus on what the microscopes should show insofar as uh, both microscopes are supposed to display red blood cells. And we already have a universally agreed criterion of what counts as a good microscope in this respect. A good microscope is something that displays something that looks a bit like this. Um, it's this sort of image. This is the kind of shape that we expect to see when we see red blood cells. Um, so we, we all agree then that the electron microscope and the fluorescence microscope are built correctly because we, we have this uh, kind of image that they both show and we all agree, yep, that's what they should show. The problem in the gravity wave case is that there was just no agreement on what results a reliable instrument should deliver. I mean, this is kind of the same point that has been raised with respect to calibration, right? Um, without that kind of prior, under, prior agreement on what the reliable results are, the regress just arises again. Uh, and you know you can't make robustness judgments. Uh, so another possible criterion, uh, which is suggested on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy page, Experiment in Physics, is uh, the so-called Sherlock Holmes strategy, where scientists achieve a consensus on a particular explanation by eliminating all other possible explanations of a result. Gravity waves aren't the only thing that can change the length of a Weber bar. You know, there, there were many other factors that could have produced the positive results Weber was getting. Electrical storms, earthquakes, cosmic rays, uh, just you know, noise produced by the uh, functioning of the instrument itself. Weber might have been more successful if he'd been able to uh, conclusively rule out such factors. As, as you, kind of, yeah, If you can eliminate other possible explanations, eventually you're just left with Know, with with one, and in Weber's case, if he could have just left been left with gravity waves, then that seems like that would have broken the regress. I mean, unfortunately, in practice, this is very limited. Um, I mean, for one thing, it seems like the only limit to alternative explanations for an experimental result is going to be the ingenuity of the scientists involved. You can come up with new explanations indefinitely, um, and in any case. Even if Weber had eliminated all the explanations anybody could think of, skeptical scientists could still have held that there's some other explanation that just hasn't yet been thought up. We will only uh, accept that Weber has eliminated all possible alternative explanations if we accept that Weber's experiment was constructed correctly. Um, so again, the regress arises. I, mean, I should also note that this Sherlock Holmes strategy doesn't really seem to apply to most scientific cases. In general, scientists don't try to go through every possible explanation in an exhaustive way. I mean, sometimes they do, but usually there's a kind of debate around a few different ideas, and many possible explanations aren't really even considered. Uh, now, so, you know, that's th th those are a few epistemological criteria that have been proposed. Uh, obviously, there are many other epistemological criteria that have been proposed. In general, then, Collins' strategy will uh, be to try to show that none of the epistemological criteria that anybody proposes are them themselves sufficient to break the experimenter's regress and produce a consensus. Uh, you know, it seems that in, in trying to apply these criteria, the regress simply arises again. So we're going to have to, yeah, we're going to have to involve uh, non-rational factors, social forces, uh, as a, a traditional philosopher might say. So, I mean, let's assume that this is right, that all the proposed epistemological criteria fail to break the regress. Is that a, a problem for v defenders of view number one, uh, you know, the view that scientific disputes can be resolved by epistemological criteria alone? Well, I think that one plausible response is just to say, you know, all, all this has really shown is that we haven't yet articulated uh, the epistemological criteria. It doesn't entail that there are no such criteria. I mean, maybe it's just that we haven't come up with them yet, which it looks like we're going to have to say that sort of thing anyway. Um, 
you know, re regardless of the arguments raised by Collins, you only have to look at the debate in philosophy of science concerning scientific method, where various views have been proposed, but nobody thinks the debate has been resolved yet. Right? You've got the hypothetical deductive method, falsificationism, Bayesianism, uh, and so on. You know, various views that we've explored in this series and some that we haven't touched on yet. Uh, these methods all face challenges. So we might think, I mean, look, this argument from the experimenter's regress is just another challenge. Um, it, it doesn't it doesn't show that there is no method. It just shows that uh, all of the methods that have so far been proposed have problems, which isn't really that surprising. You know, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of work before we get to the answers. So maybe the right response to Collins, rather than trying to come up with watertight rules that solve the regress, is just to accept that we don't yet know what the uh, complete rules of science are, but that one day we might know. Um, you know, I mean, maybe that's uh, a kind of line we we might take here. Um, so a, a rather different kind of objection to Collins that some have raised, uh, for example, Benoit uh, Godin and Yves Gingras, is that the experimenter's regress isn't anything new, right? It's just a rehearsal of a classic sceptical argument. Um, so we, we've seen that various proposed criteria fail to break the regress. Now, why is this, right? Is, is there a general reason why the regress keeps re-arising? I think there is. Um, in all the cases that we've looked at, the trouble seems to be that it's always possible for scientists to f save their favoured interpretation of the experiment. No matter what criticisms are raised against Weber, it's always going to be possible for Weber to make moves so as to save his belief in gravity waves. So you know, if you calibrate your instrument using electrostatic pulses uh, and your instrument has a negative result, Weber can just say, well, electrostatic pulses are not a good surrogate for gravity waves. Um, you, know, you, can, you can always kind of make these shifts in your belief so as to retain some favoured belief. Now this is actually a very familiar argument. It's basically the Duhan-Quine thesis. Uh, the basic claim of the Duhan-Quine thesis is that no hypothesis is tested in isolation. Uh, whenever you test a hypothesis you assume a host of auxiliary assumptions. This is something that um, we've already covered earlier in the series. So. Uh, after the discovery of Uranus, scientists could use Uranus to test Newtonian mechanics by checking to see if Uranus matched the predictions of Newtonian mechanics. It turned out that it didn't. But scientists didn't then throw out Newtonian mechanics um, because, in fact, you know, the fact that the, that the predictions were wrong doesn't show that Newtonian mechanics is wrong because in order to make that prediction, we needed to uh, make uh, the assumption that there are no unknown forces that would be affecting the orbit of Uranus. And of course it turned out that there was such a force. There was the gravitational interaction with Neptune. And the point is that in this kind of manoeuvre, um, you know, just logically speaking, it can always be made, right? So if, if the, let's say Neptune didn't exist, okay, and so we, we hadn't discovered Neptune, would that then refute Newtonian mechanics? Well, no, because maybe there's some other force, right? Uh, maybe there's some sort of strange magnetic phenomena or something like that. Uh, and if it's not some other force, well, maybe uh, it's just that our telescopes are inaccurate or maybe light behaves differently far out in the solar system so that we're not getting an accurate image. You, know, you can come up with ideas like these indefinitely. It's possible to believe that the Earth is flat if you just make enough adjustments to your other beliefs. You, you can do that, right? That's just a, a kind of logical point. Well, in just the same way, we can retain a favoured interpretation of uh, ex an experimental result in the face of any criticism anybody proposes. Again, that, that's a logical point. Weber could have, in principle, maintained that his apparatus was reliable while still being consistent. And, I mean, you know, we might think, okay, this undermines rationalist views of science because it entails that no rational method can compel a particular conclusion. Um, many conclusions will be compatible with whatever rational methods we propose. Uh, so that means that other factors like social forces will be involved in producing a consensus. Uh, that argument is extremely questionable. Um, you know, there's a, a lot to be said there. 
but in any case, you know, it's it's an argument that's sort of already been given. So there's nothing that the experimenter's regress doesn't bring anything new to this argument. Uh, that's just the point I'm making here. That uh, some people have suggested that Collins hasn't really uh, located a, a new problem. Although I'm I'm not really uh, uh, sure about that. I mean, what I think is quite interesting about the experimenter's regress is. Uh, Maybe Collins doesn't so much come up with a new skeptical problem, but he just shows how a certain how certain skeptical problems arise uh, when we try to uh, actually perform experiments and come to the right experimental result. I mean, a lot of um, you know discussion in philosophy of science, uh, like if you read Firebend uh, and Kuhn, right, they will point out how. Um, you can retain a theory even, and scientists often retain theories, even when there are maybe lots of experimental results that seem to refute the theory. So this is the kind of objection to falsificationism, that actually all theories are born falsified. Um, but this kind of argument assumes that we have a, a consensus on the experimental results. Collins's argument um, kind, kind of challenges us to think about how we ever come to a consensus that an experiment poses a problem for a theory in the first place. You know, how, how do you come to a consensus on an experimental result in the first place? Uh, so that's the experimenter's regress. Um, that's all I'm going to talk about today. Thanks for watching.